Hello, listeners of the Eastern Border Podcast. This is Sean and Eric of the Strange Matters Podcast. At Strange Matters, we discuss anything just outside the norm, ranging from the bizarre and unexplained to the supernatural and paranormal and everything in between. Our episodes range from unsolved mysteries, bizarre crimes, mythical creatures, and weird conspiracies from all over the world. If this sounds like your type of show, come check us out at our website, strangematterspodcast.com, or find us on iTunes or other podcast apps. We hope to have you join us in our discussions of anything and everything strange and bizarre. In the meantime, enjoy this episode of the excellent Eastern Border Podcast. Keep up the good work, comrade. People are drawn to personalities. We like larger-than-life figures, the so-called great men of history. Sometimes they deserve it, sometimes, well, sometimes things just get weird. And I'm not talking United States presidential election weird, but Soviet cult of personality weird. See, right now, there exists a subsect of the Orthodox Russian Church in Russia, obviously, it's called... Chapel of Russia's Restoration. They worship Vladimir Putin as a saint, considering him a reincarnation of Saint Paul, who was there to restore the greatness of Russia and would bring about the second coming of Jesus. The leader of the sect, the 62-year-old Mother Fotina, considers herself to be a reincarnation of the Joan of Arc. Just as Saul persecuted Christians before his conversion to Saint Paul, She believes Putin once beset the faithful as a Soviet KGB officer. I kid you not. Now, if this seems strange and dangerous, consider the following. During the intermittent period, while Dmitry Medvedev was president in Putin's hometown of St. Petersburg, a proliferation of posters once showed the then Prime Minister Putin as an angel, with one hand extended blessing the city's inhabitants. Putin's face was mounted on a photo of the cherubim crowning the city's city's Peter and Paul Cathedral. And now, just this year, Putin officially placed flowers on Stalin's grave, paying respect to the old mass murderer, bank robber and warmonger on the 5th of March, the date when he died. A lot of Russian people did the same, seemingly longing for him to return. There is a place for him too in the hierarchy of saints over there. Makes one wonder... What will happen to Gorbachev when he'll die? Or for the Putin himself? Uh, Yes, yes, this is still a Gorby Part 2 episode, if you were wondering. We'll get there, don't worry. Now that you know about Chernobyl and Gorbachev's interesting early political career from the previous episodes, it's important to note that he got the Nobel Peace Prize in 1990. The same year, we in Latvia signed our Declaration of Independence, for, <clears throat> quote, his leading role in the peace process which today characterizes important parts of the international community, end quote. Now, I know that the Nobel Peace Prize hasn't been what it was supposed to be lately, or ever, really. It wasn't awarded to Gandhi, although he was nominated five times for it, for one, and then there's that Obama getting one instantly thing. But still, it's a very prestigious award. Did Gorbachev really deserve it? Over here, we think he got it for not sending the tanks in when we started to think about independence. But it wasn't his call by that time, even. And unlike totalitarian Russian greatness leaders, he doesn't get much love in there. Instead, he's carrying the blame for the collapse of the USSR and is considered the one who brought Russia to its all-time low. Controversial man, our old Gorby. Just as everything in these parts. Now, back to the Church of Putin, just for a second there, just to set the mood. Mother Fotina was born as Svetlana Frolova. She sat in jail for 21 months during the 1990s because she embezzled money from the state as a civil servant. After that, she opened a, quote, Center for Cosmo-Energetic Medicine and later the Temple of the Resurrection of Russia. Her followers believe that Fotina can heal by the laying on of hands. 
They believe she can pray diseases like leukemia away. For such services, they sometimes hand her envelopes labeled for the love. The Orthodox Church accuses her of witchcraft. One reason is that she competes with the local church of St. Nicholas, the the miracle worker, and alienates pious donors. A retired army officer in her neighborhood has said in an interview for the German newspaper Der Spiegel, quote, A few years ago, the Orthodox Church put the state police, FSB, a successor to the KGB, on her trail. After that, she started to praise Putin in public as a saint, to protect herself from investigation. And, again, it's all about cynicism and a quick cash grab, as most things in the Putin administration and in the Soviet Union before that. But the people, the people just love larger-than-life figures, don't they? We come back to the people now. A little reminder about where we stand, namely Glasnost. After the Chernobyl, Gorbachev had had enough of the apparatchiks, holding the economy and the governmental apparatus in strict control. So, Glasnost, as I mentioned on Gorby Part 1, was born. Now, don't confuse this for a true freedom of speech, no, no, no. It was just a means of using vague and unclear slogans in place of actual liberties. The main goal of this policy was to make the country's management transparent and open to debate for the first time allowing to criticize not only the factory and kolkhoz directors and the like, but the party organizers as well, thus circumventing the endless hordes of minor bureaucrats and their petty interests. Gorby hoped that people hated the damn clerics more than they hated the system. So maybe, just maybe, if he could make everyone join hands and sing that weird Kumbaya song by the fireplace, everything would be okay, right? Right? Well, not really. For starters, not everyone was happy about this. And I'm not talking about the party officials themselves here. Quite a lot of common people were also unsatisfied with this, especially in conjunction with Gorbachev's other programs. There was a saying, circulating around at the time, allowed to criticize prohibited to drink, because of the prohibition laws, and people not seeing any real change in the beginning stages of the program. But... Weird things started to happen, which made everyone feel strange. You see, there's a certain degree of animosity, okay, a large degree of animosity, between Azerbaijan and Armenia, even today. They have a sort of, kind of, truce over there, which has been broken an insane amount of times, because of the unrecognized, semi-independent, kind of autonomous territory of Mountain Karabakh, known as the Spitak province uh, in the time. It's a territory mostly inhabited by Armenians, but which, due to the Soviet laws, was added to Azerbaijan. By the way, just as Crimea was added to Ukraine during the Soviet time by Khrushchev. Now, this situation is a bit different, because over there, the territory right now belongs to Azerbaijan, but it's effectively autonomous, uses Armenian currency for their own money, everyone speaks Armenian there, and Armenia actively supports them but Azerbaijan insists that as it is literally an enclave of their territory, it should be their territory. So, obviously, there's a conflict there, and neither of both sides want to give up the mountainous piece of land to the other one. De facto, like I said, it's a separate country, with its own army and everything, but nobody recognizes it. Well, the conflicts were already starting in the late Soviet era, and people understood that, holy crap, this Glasnost thing is real and not just an attempt to pull up and put us all in prison. When suddenly, suddenly, in the TV, you could see not only the pretty things, cartoons and everything, and how everything was nice, but how Armenians and the Azerbaijanis were literally murdering each other in the region. <laughs> this opened the floodgates, especially after how Chernobyl incident was being tried to cover up in the beginning. See, what Gorbachev didn't took into the consideration or just was naive about was that it suddenly was okay to discuss not only the errors of the officials, but also historical events. First off, already in Russia there were issues about this. The common people were immensely shocked, because not counting the intelligentsia, intelligentsia, to be more precise, the intelligent elites, nobody knew what really had been going on in the October Revolution. 
people growing up in the Soviet system and being educated and indoctrinated in the Soviet way of life, they were scared and shocked when they heard all around them that Lenin's coup was just that, a coup, and not really a massive, extremely popular uprising. I really wonder what they thought about the civil war that followed after the Lenin's coup and how that went down then before that, but still. And they also, before that, didn't know that Lenin had been supported by Kaisers, yeah, Kaiser Wilhelm's German government in the World War I, sometimes even spying for that government against the Tsar, and that he had also shot, shot and starved a large amount of people, and in the end died from syphilis. They had grown up with this image, which is sometimes pervasive even today, that Lenin was a clean, excellent, moral person with no negative traits whatsoever, and that the Communist Party were as clean as the man himself thinking that only the Stalin was the bad guy in the whole bunch. Which is weird, because that guy is obviously praised as an excellent person even now in Russia. The people refused to believe these facts, which suddenly the so-called intelligentsia would publish in various books and magazines. Sometimes all of this was treated as nothing more as Western propaganda, filthy Americans spreading their lies. But the facts were there. Lenin's own writings and everything, and, and shock soon grew into confusion, and then, then anger. And it was even worse in the non-Russian Soviet republics. Everyone, Baltic states, Ukraine, Belarus, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Armenia, all the Central Asian stands, you know, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, everyone was tried of this thing, and they noticed that, hey, we can talk about how we really were incorporated in this massive Soviet state. So, literature journals, newspapers, books, everything, started spewing out tons and tons of actual history, the memory of the oppressed people coming out there and being visible. See, the people didn't like the apparatchiks, but they hated the system too, a lot. And the cultures, they weren't Russian, but Russianness, had been enforced in all of these countries, in schools, politics, society everywhere. There were constant, relentless attempts to Russify, as we call it here, all the Soviet people, and we didn't like it. In the beginning, everyone was careful about this, and even though some said that we should really support Gorby and deepen the perestroika, mostly people were just interested in being careful in the first time, so that this wouldn't stop, but slowly, the talks about dissent grew ever stronger. Which, in... Which, by the way, allowed people to get a hold of many important cultural works from the outside. For example, we over here were suddenly allowed to start to communicate with the emigre Latvians, whose families left during the Second World War, and we learned about books that some of them had written. And this was also the first time when we learned about the Coral Castle built by Edvard Sliatskalnic, which is a mystery to this day. I actually hope that the guys from The Strange Matters which you heard during our introduction, take a look at this, as I find it to be an extremely interesting subject to look at. Now, a little note here. I'll be mostly talking about what happened in Latvia during the time, as I have acquired newspapers from that era, and my dad's here, and I just don't know that much about Lithuania or Estonia or other countries. Not enough to be competent enough to discuss this right now. Now, the situation in the Poland and the unification of Germany does deserve their own episodes, which are on my list now, by the way. But for this one, we'll stick mainly to the events in Latvia and Russia. I hope you don't mind that, but it's impossible to put everything in a single episode. Also, this was the heyday of the press at the time, by the way. Well, I mentioned the newspapers. Most people went and bought and read every single newspaper that could be acquired, and they did it on a daily basis. The newspapers were extremely cheap. A newspaper cost about as much as a pack of matches, so people stocked up on them, reading both the patriotic ones to remind themselves that they were doing the right thing, and also the communist ones, because you just had to know what the enemy was doing. Interestingly enough, people didn't start to love Gorbachev more. No, he was seen as a weak politician. Weak leader who just couldn't keep the country under control anymore. It wasn't the situation where a benevolent leader gives more rights to the people. No, no, no. This was an enemy. Showing that the time to strike is now. 
So we did our best to do so. You see, what was also allowed was that after Chernobyl, non-governmental organizations of non-political sort were allowed. In Latvia, one of the first such NGOs was the Vidis Eisardzibus Klubs, or the Environmental Preservation Club, which of course served as, as a front to an independence and an anti-Soviet movement. They were involved in the first protest action, which really evoked the idea of, hey, it's not right, in the people. A newspaper called Atmode, or Awakening, and that's also how we call the whole process of getting independence from the Soviet Union, this newspaper was extremely popular at the time. And they had found out that the government in Moscow wanted to build another dam, another power station, on our central river Daugava. Nobody enjoyed this, for two reasons. Firstly, everyone knew that the Soviets didn't give a damn about culture or ecology. And the last time, in the 60s, they'd built a dam on the river, they had exploded and flooded one of our most beautiful and culturally important natural monuments, the Staburaks Cliffs. To put things in perspective, imagine you'd level and flood the Yellowstone Park or something, to build a power station on top of it, because your oppressive government tells you to. You'd be pretty pissed off too, I think. And it's not like there weren't other parts of Daugava where to build it. Secondly, the massive construction meant that even more Russians and people from other Soviet republics, but mostly Russians, would be moved here, with apartments built for them, even though our own people lived in communal apartments, like three families for a three-room apartment and the like, and our culture and language would be threatened again. Today, the Russian population here is about 35-40%. to Sometimes the numbers go as low as 30, but I'd say it's about 37 in the middle of these two numbers. And it's all due to the previously mentioned Soviet efforts of colonization and Russification. Back then, with all the Soviet army parts and workers here, the situation was far worse. The Russians were about half of the population... Russians were about a half of the population, about 50%. And because of this dam, even more of them would be forcibly transported here. And we were at risk of becoming an oppressed ethnic minority in our own country. This this just couldn't stand. So resistance was starting to slowly build up. For starters, a petition which gathered signatures against this project was started. Which was a risky move, and people were careful because those who had tried to do the same thing the last time, when Staburaks was destroyed, were declared enemies of the state and sent off to Siberian gulags, where the nice men from the KGB could look after them all the time. This petition managed to achieve that a special commission was sent from Moscow to re-evaluate the project. They rechecked it, and a conclusion was made that it wasn't economically beneficial to build the dam. So, it was cancelled. This was viewed as a major victory for Latvia. I have heard another theory about this, that the Soviets had planned to build the dam, had announced it, but wanted to get out of the whole endeavor because of lack of money and resources. This also seems viable, but then again, it was an internal project, which meant that, due to how the economy functioned, money wasn't that much of a problem. Either way, the people and not only in Latvia, but in all the Baltic republics, rejoiced about this fact, and started to think that if we have achieved this, why not do something more, something riskier? This started to influence everything, including the culture. For culture was important in this, as I've spoken in the third episode, but some recap and some more information here. The Latvian documentary film, which I've mentioned in the previous episode of of this podcast, I think it was the Afghanistan War one. Is it easy to be young? By the director Yuri Spodniks. It showed the trial, a show trial, for a bunch of teenagers who had demolished a train after a rock concert, all the while touching on the subjects like the utter disinterest in the system by the Soviet youth, which proved to be vital in the whole awakening thing, as we call it here. You can watch the whole movie online, by the way, with English subtitles if you look for it. Now, I can't tell you exactly where and how to find it due to various copyright laws, but the place starts with you and ends with something that rhymes with lube, and you should really give it a try, to catch the zeitgeist of the time, I think. 
And talking about rock music, which was also involved in this movie, you know, it was officially prohibited before Gorbachev. But it came out from the underground. It's safe to say that the Soviet Union fell, while rock of various degrees of hardness was blasted out loudly. The punk movement was extremely popular, both in the Baltics and in other Soviet republics. Not that the Soviet leadership and the, like the music much, as it was inspiring the young people to vent their anger at the system. Latvian bands like Parkons and Leave were officially persecuted, but this happened in Russia too. I'm sure you've heard of a musician called Viktor Tsoi, from the band Kino. He was extremely influential all over the USSR, and KGB followed him closely, considering him a major threat to the party and the communist ideology. You see, he died in a car crash on the 15th of August 1990 in Latvia. The fans of the band, and there are many of them, and I know some people who listen to this podcast are also fans of him, readings to you, still place flowers in the place of the accident each year. Now, the official version is that Tsoi fell asleep while driving, after which the Moskvich 2141 car entered the opposite lane of the road and crashed with an Icarus 250 bus. If that seems weird to you, then yes it is, because at the time almost nobody bought it. We could sign the Declaration of Independence back then, but this was well before the barricades and the August coup in Russia and actual independence being gained, so KGB still had a lot of power, and they really, really hated Tsoi. Now, it's not proven or anything, and maybe he did just fall asleep, but frankly, I do believe that the Soviet authorities had something to do with this, as his death was just too convenient, and they had been involved with similar strange deaths before. Oh, what the hell, might as well talk about another KGB murder of an artist if we're into this. It was a poet, by the name of Klaus Ellsbergs. Not widely known in the USSR, but quite popular in the Baltics. <laughs> Back then, poets were more popular than today, it seems. Klaus Ellsbergs was born in Riga. His mother was another influential Latvian poet, Wisma Belshevitsa. He had studied French philology in the Latvian university, and, using his knowledge... He was a major translator of the French poetry, including a collection of poems by Guillaume Apollinaire. I'm sorry if I butchered that name. Ellsbergs also has translated works of Kurt Vonnegut, introducing the author to Latvian audiences. His, tra- his translation of Slaughterhouse Five is still considered the classic Latvian edition. Also, he was one of the founding editors of Avots, an influential intellectual monthly that introduced avant-garde and politically charged subjects during this glasnost period. Ellsbergs was a Western-thinking person and the leading poet of his generation. Klaus Ellsbergs died on February 5, 1987, in an accident. He fell out of a window while in the writer's guild house in Dubult Jurmala. Official version, published by the authorities at the time, was that, again, this was an accident. His death is surrounded with rumors and suspicions. And although the internet tries to tell me that there's just a theory that he's been murdered, every Latvian at the time knew that for sure. Ex-KGB guys have come out with testimonials. He himself had told the family members before he left from Riga to Jurmal that they're onto him and had he's being followed. Listening devices were later found at his apartment where he lived, etc. and so on. Believing that one of the rising stars of his generation, an optimistic and a happy man, would fall out of a window... And these weren't those wall-wide windows. These were the regular ones, like in most apartment buildings. Or that he jumped out of it to commit suicide. Believing this is, for me, just as hard as it to believe that Tsoi would just randomly, in bright daylight, out of nowhere, fall asleep while driving a car. And we have seen, and by now you have heard, enough about the Soviet Secret Service to know how they operated. Controversial man, that Gorby, ain't he? The next, big, mass action thing didn't stop with the petition and signatures and media attention. Next thing caused actual products to happen. We come down to Riga Metro. This is where you might get confused, because Metro seems to be a good thing for a city, right? Well, not in this case. The major of Riga at the time, Alfred Zrubix, had built a major project before the suspension bridge over Daugava, and that had brought in more people from Russia. You see what I'm going with this? Yes, it all comes back to the colonization situation. 
Her language was at stake, and we took it very seriously. After the petition, people knew that they could do more. It was a signal that something could actually be achieved. So one of the central parks, the Arcadian Park, became the gathering place for the various protests against this. Environmental Protection Club wasn't the only organization by then. LNNK, Latvian National Independence Movement, and LTF, Latvian People's Front, were the most important amongst all of them. And they didn't hide their intentions at all, unlike the Environmental Club. The Arcadian Park was also very symbolic, because it's right next to the Tornjakalms train station, where in 1940 and in 1949, people were put in their trains, trains originally intended for transporting cattle, and driven off to starve and work and die in Siberia. So it meant a lot to both of us and the Soviet leadership that those first protests happened nearby this significant and tragic location. Another interesting tangent here, by the way. The major at the time, the before-mentioned Rubiks, would be remembered as one of the best mayors of Riga of all time, if not for the whole independence movement thing. He was one of the so-called ideal communists. He wasn't corrupt at all. He didn't steal. And, thus, he lived with his wife and two sons in a small two-room apartment in Riga, instead of a mansion. He sincerely worked in the interests of the working class, was an extremely devout Leninist, and sincerely thought that it was only corrupt bureaucrats that ruined the whole thing. Obviously, he couldn't understand why we, Latvians, and everyone else for that matter, didn't want to live under the Russian Soviet rule. Because the system, in his mind, was the most wonderful thing created by mankind. He thought that all the people were paid for by the CIA and other Western agencies, agencies <clears throat> and that it was all the fault of the filthy capitalists that this whole thing didn't work out as intended. This forced him to do some less than nice things when the independence movement really got going. But back to the metro thing. Obviously, everyone knew that even during Glasnost, you couldn't state the main reason about the metro openly. You just couldn't say that, hey, we seriously don't want more people who are not Latvians here, who'll never learn our language, will treat us like second rate citizens. So the official reasons why people were protesting were that the soil under Riga wasn't suited for a metro, and could cause collapse of historical buildings. That, and we had, and still have, by the way, trams, trolley buses, regular buses, and micro buses everywhere. Our public system, <clears throat> our public transportation system is excellent. And metro was a luxury, but it wouldn't be economically beneficial. This whole thing ended with a small bit of furor and confusion from Rubik's, who really, really wanted us to have a metro. But, as due to the limited capabilities of the Soviet state, many cities were actually waiting in line to get one, and bribes were lavishly given to various bureaucrats to move upon the line. Moscow just shook their head and quickly deleted Riga from the list and moved on to the next city that wanted one. Now, and you might think that this is some sort of Russophobia here, or God forbid even racism, but it's not that simple. Back in the day, in our capital, there were certain suburbs, certain districts of those tall, large apartment buildings, the blockhouses, like we call them Khrushchevka. You see, these districts... They were almost they were inhabited almost only by Russian speakers, and they didn't like us at all. In the outer parts of Riga, like Bolderai or Tiangarax, Bolderai is the very northern part of Riga, by the way, it was actually dangerous to go to the store in the evening and speak Latvian. You would be beaten up, possibly mugged by angry teenagers. They didn't like us, didn't understand why we insisted on talking in this strange non-Russian language, viewed us as possibly Western agents, Nazi supporters or worse, and they knew we didn't like them. There were separate schools for Latvian and Russian children back then. Russians living here weren't taught Latvian at all, but Latvians had to be fully fluent in Russian. Because of this, the whole education program for the Russian flow schools was 10 grades and 11 grades for Latvians. We only shifted to the Western 12-grade model after the Soviet Union fell. The enmity was there, and it was serious. For one, also because we got the people who, even in the Soviet Union, often couldn't manage their lives and had to live in the poorer end of Russia. Now, often we got really educated and really great guys over here. 
I by no means want to insult the Russians living in here currently. They they are great people and they've been born here, but for the most part they were forcibly moved here. And the Soviet Union wasn't picky. Although if you were sent here from university, your attitude might be a bit different, and a lot of them helped during our independence movement due to some very vague and mostly false promises of our own government, to which I'll get in the next episode probably. But in the end, it wasn't their fault, and I don't hate Russian people. But the system had corrupted and brainwashed quite a few. And, you know, teenagers being teenagers, angry Russian teenagers found out that they weren't really punished for violence against Latvians. Now, I do have to say that we Latvians at times weren't much better fighting back, but still, all this talk, it didn't come from nowhere. Another interesting tangent is that by this point, the Soviet man had already learned to read between the lines and understand what all of this was about. People were very accustomed to the language of bureaucracy, the propaganda, the new speak, if you won't stab me for using that term. Things in the official media rarely meant what their face value was. You can see that in this Metro case, but to give you more colorful examples, here's a little something from my dad. For one, imagine this. There's a huge concert in the opera to commemorate and celebrate the October Revolution. This was during the 20 years which my dad spent working there, playing bass in the orchestra. A minor detail. During intermissions, or before concerts, even the musicians in the orchestra pit weren't allowed to even go to the bathroom without being escorted by a KGB agent. In fears of them meeting foreign agents, as our opera is excellent, we have quite a few famous classical musicians even today, and it was a popular tourist destination. That, and fears of bombing and other acts of terrorism, of course. KGB was everywhere, and they were monitoring the opera, and this is important. But that aside and continuing, this concert is special. It's dedicated to the October Revolution. And back then, everything, completely everything, was rehearsed. The draperies in front of the stage were crimson red. Current Latvian flag, crimson red. The first song was about to be sung by Germaine Hene Wagner. A bit unusual name for a Latvian, but she was a native, and she was to sing while the front curtains weren't yet opened. She's the opening piece. The rehearsal goes completely okay, nothing unusual. She's wearing a dark blue dress. But when the main concert starts... She steps on the stage in a long, very sleeved, completely white dress. And when she's singing, she even raises her hands up, stretches them, in the, stretches them in the air, and thus creates the image of her own crimson, white, crimson, independent Latvian flag on the stage as a symbol. And it's to commemorate the October Revolution, mind you. The director of the opera was panicking, obviously, but nothing followed this. As my dad said, it was probably because Czech agents didn't want to admit their incompetence and would get into trouble themselves for allowing this. So they just let it slide. I imagine it was a bit of a shock for everyone in the auditorium listening to this. And the second example. There was a poem by a Latvian poet, Iman Zieduanis, which was almost forbidden. It was a poem officially about alder trees. The poem is about how alders press themselves and start growing into fields, farms, and start overtaking buildings. Basically about how the nature is slowly overtaking land from humans if humans don't care enough. But the thing is, alder is an invasive species. And the poem was already full with metaphors. And it was written at about the same time as the petition against the dam and the protest against the metro. And when read in this light, everyone understood that the poem was just a way how to metaphorically tell Latvians if they don't try harder, they didn't care, then the colonizing Soviets would overtake this country, and that we should become more active and not allow this to happen. Obviously, Zedons was looked at very, very closely. But technically, it was all about elders. And he could use that in his defense, if anything, getting himself an immunity of sorts. He also had received literary awards before, and had been publicly praised by the party figures, so it would be really, really bad for the PR, for the government to go after him. Well-known and a well-respected poet throughout the whole Union. And he didn't do crazy things either, like, you know, driving alone, or staying alone in the rooms on the top floors of rem in remote locations. So, he was a bit more safer. And now, 
a brief intermission before we move back to the tales of the late 80s. So, greetings. This is how it's going to be from now on, I suppose. We're collaborating with the Strange Matters, and there's going to be three episodes in March. This one, then the one that's going to be the collaboration, and the other one which is going to be the regular episode. But <clears throat> we're going to be continuing to work with the Dark Myths guys. I hope, I just love the, those podcast people, and you should like really check them all out at darkmyths.org. They support me a lot, and I know that a lot of you are here because of Dark Myths, and I'm happy to be there. So give go give them a try. And that's the second thing. Of course, uh, <clears throat> the mandatory things that we have our webpage, theeasternbar.lv, which is important, by the way, because um, we are participating in a book project right now. It's called Casting the Past by Heather of the Renaissance England podcast. Uh, it's a book where history podcasters talk about their experiences in podcasting, share some strange tales, just talk to you guys to listen to all of us a bit. And you can, and, I'm, and I'm a part of this book as well, just as my buddy from Dark Myths, Travis, from the Bohemian podcast, and History of Germany, and History of Alchemy, and, and the, that cabinet thing. He's a really prophetic guy. Well, yeah, you can get this book if you want to read a bit in an ebook format about how we podcasters spend our days and what drives us to do this thing. Buying it for four ninety nine on either Smashwords.com or iBooks or Kobo or Barnes and Noble. And if you enter a promo code there when you purchase this book, Costing the Past, if you enter this promo code FQ27K, that's FQ27K, you can read about the sh- you can read about our show and get yourself the book a bit cheaper. The links will be posted on the Eastern Border LV and our other social media sites. And that's sort of the big event here. Oh yeah, other social media sites. We're on Twitter and on Facebook, and you can find us there. Also, if you're listening to this on iTunes, please leave us a good review. And many and great thanks to all of those who have done so already. And of course, a special humongous thank you, extremely huge thank you, to all of our Patreon supporters. They are great guys who keep the show alive, and of course to all of those who just donate in PayPal as well. And if you want to become a supporter of the show, and at the end of March get some swag in your mail, because we have finally... It's crazy how much time all of this takes and how busy I am lately. But uh, we have all those rubles and more medals, which we are going to get to sending finally. We are finally doing this this draw, which we promised early, I presume, even before Chernobyl. So if you want to enter this and support the show and help me actually visit America once in my life, then please become our Patreon supporter at patreon.com forward slash the eastern border. We will be very thankful if you do so. Now, some questions from the listeners should be answered. For one, people have asked, well, will we finish the podcast when we just get through the collapse of the Soviet Union? I have mentioned this in previous episodes, but no, no, we will not. Because, for one, I plan on, as requested by people, moving on to the, at least, the Yeltsin's era. I'm not sure if I'm going to go full Putin, because that's already politics, not history. But I, I'm pretty sure I can take a look at Boris Yeltsin. And, of course, I want to go back and revisit the revolution, the original October Revolution once again. And then there's the Eastern Front, and then there are the Stalin years, and then there are the various special things which I want to talk about such as the one I'm going to do it do next time, which is going to be the Space Race episode. And I still have to look at the childhood and all other sorts of things, because we'll be running for years. I can assure you that one. So don't worry, we'll be here. If you support us and if you help us, and we are terribly thankful to all of you who do, and we are terribly thankful to our comrades at Dark Myths Collective. And yeah, go check out all of us and enjoy the show. Write to us at theeasternborder at gmail.com or comment on Facebook or message us on Twitter. We, we listen and we answer to every email that we get. And now, back to the show. You know, there was a joke in the Soviet Union about this perestroika thing. Okay, of course there was. No surprises there. <clears throat> the Armenian radio is back to the program. <clears throat> 
Armenian radio gets asked, what's going to happen after perestroika? Armenian radio answers, perestrelka. Perestrelka actually means a firefight. And it's a grim wordplay here. Thankfully, it didn't end like this, but it was close. You see, the collapse of the Soviet system wouldn't really go on so peacefully if there wouldn't be the tactical cunning of Gorby pushing for perestroika and glasnost for a while and working against the apparatchiks. With the narrative covered a bit, let's talk about the Gorby himself and his thoughts on, the whole, on this whole process. As it's objectively necessary to look at the man himself and sort of the other side of this perestroika. You know, every, the other side of all of this. And yes, it just seems that we won't get through with the all of the collapse of the Soviet Union in this episode. We'll get to it eventually, I suppose. Now, <clears throat> Anatoly Gorbunov, patriot and at the time the leader of the Latvian Higher Council, what passed as the official head organ in the Latvian SSR, and the word Soviet means council, by the way, so this is where the Soviet Union comes from, <clears throat> in an interview remembered a very intense party central committee meeting in Moscow. All sorts of delegates from the various districts, especially those who were generals in the army, yelled that Perestroika was not being allowed to do everything, that it had to be stopped. Gorbunov remembers. Quote, I had the feeling that it's all over, that everything will stop. That was the atmosphere in the meeting room. End quote. Gorbachev had agreed to that, saying that, yes, democracy really doesn't mean that we can do everything that we want and this process needs to be closely monitored. But, at the same time, the new party course is for this glasnost and democratization. But it's strictly based on Lenin's writings, of course. So changing that would mean turning away from Lenin. So by this focus on Lenin, he could make everyone happy, so everything would just move on. But... Gorbachev also spoke weirdly, and was a bit strange. One of his colleagues in the Politburo... Alexander Yakovlev describes this manner of speech as unfathomable, and he describes Gorby himself as an energetical vampire. The flow of his words, both in international speeches and just meeting people on the street at random, could be near infinite and seemingly endless, only for the listener to find out at the end of the conversation that nothing of substance from his speech had remained in memory. Quoting Yakovlev, quote, His essence was a game. You simply can't get to his soul in any way. Sometimes it seemed that he himself is afraid of introspection, afraid to look inside himself, because he was afraid of what he would see there. He didn't want to find out something about himself that he didn't know already or didn't want to know. Complicated and controversial man, our old friend Gorby. During his few years of rule, Gorbachev's speeches only became more and more incoherent even though the people, having felt a taste of freedom, were expecting more preciseness and straight-talking. Which just played to their feelings, that all of this was happening because of his weakness and incapability to rule and not much else. This gave the necessary courage for the change from inside to happen. Besides, in these two years we've been talking about here, in part one and right now, 1986 and 1987, the badly working and efficient Soviet economical model had been on the path of transformation to a form of Soviet capitalism, which in turn didn't work at all. The people got poor, poorer and hungrier, so started to look at the West even more, hoping to get some sort of relief from there. Now, this Anatoly Gorbunov, who joined the Latvian National Front during the awakening period and became one of our leaders of the independence movement, <coughs> he had spent a lot of time in Moscow, talking with Gorbachev personally, both in the meetings and outside them. So what he has to tell is especially important. Now, he's a controversial figure as well, only throwing his lot in completely when he knew that the collapse would be inevitable. But he explains that as well in some of his writings. It is strange, however, that a man who condemns the protests against the Riga Metro a year later public publicly states that everyone who has put his Communistic Party membership card aside is no longer a communist and shouldn't be viewed with suspicion. He proclaimed deep patriotic feelings publicly, but all of this just was his background and luggage. But, you know, who am I to judge? Anyhow, Gorbunov 
remembers a certain meeting between various higher council presidium chairmen of the Soviet republics, who, in their position, automatically were also Gorbachev's assistant managers, and he remembers their actions in this meeting with Gorby. He doesn't mention any names, but I suppose that's not as important. The special thing about the meeting was that Gorbachev had actually tried to ask for their opinions on various subjects, and, quoting Gorbunov, <clears throat> some older men were getting extremely confused. What, does our opinion matter? There's the Central Committee opinion. We're not supposed to follow that or something? Huh. Interestingly. We've been talking about Latvia so far, but let's look at Russia for a bit. There, the feeling of changes hit hard when the famous dissident and academic Sakharov was released from his seven years long exile in Gorky in the 19th of December 1986, a month before the official announcement of the Perestroika course in the USSR Central Committee conference a month later. Thus, things started to change here in the Baltics a bit later than in Moscow. There, the thick and popular journals like Novi Mir, The New World, Drozba Narodov, The Friendship of Nations, and first and foremost, <clears throat> Aganyok, The Little Fire basically ran a competition on who could be the more open one and the clear one and reveal more of the previously unthinkable materials than the other magazines. This is where the people found out about how the October Revolution really happened, like I mentioned at the beginning of this episode. We, in the Baltics, became the leading force of the reforms only later, when it was clear that the whole house of bloody cards would collapse. And no, I haven't seen the show. In the beginning... Gorby was a bit confused with what was going on. Remember, he wanted this, he wanted the, these reforms, he wanted the socialism to continue, for the USSR to grow stronger but more democratic. He cared about the people, and there were counterforces at work, so he actively supported the reforms and the activities in the Baltics, because he hoped that the support from the people and the party here would help him deal with his political opponents. But again, he never, absolutely never, thought that the Soviet Union might collapse when he started this whole thing. Gorbunov, who had discussed this matter with Gorbachev a lot, again, tells in his memoirs. He thought that one of the existing models should be reached, either EU or Federal Germany or the United States of America, which holds together a unified country, but grants a certain degree of autonomy at the same time. What happened at the Congress of the USSR nation deputies, Central Committee of the Communistic Party and other institutions didn't show anything suspicious that would mean the collapse of the USSR, and even more, the independence of the Baltics in such a short time. I seriously thought at this time that we needed five or even ten years minimum, moving extremely slowly, step by step, or even half step by half step, to gain full independence. Hmm. Gorbunov is also a strange man. Now, to end this episode, and a fine note, let's touch politics a bit. Just a little bit. You see, unlike other shows, I'm kind of both allowed and supposed to do that. It's relevant, you see, and I promised I would. So, time to do my promises. Gorbachev, relatively recently, in a 2009 interview to the Washington Post, stated that the West needed their own perestroika now. Looking at what's going on now in the world... I find it useful to take a look at this interview. And this is going to be a long one, from the interview. Quote, In the West, the breakup of the Soviet Union was viewed as a total victory. That proved that the West did not need to change. Western leaders were convinced that they were the helm of the right system and of a well-functioning, almost perfect economic model. Scholars opined that, the the that history had ended, that Washington consensus the dogma of free markets, the regulation and balanced budgets at any cost, was force-fed to the rest of the world. But then came the economic crisis of 2008 and 2009, and it became clear that the new Western model was an illusion that benefits, benefited chiefly the very rich. Statistics show that the poor and the middle class saw little or no benefit from the economic growth of the past decades. The current global crisis demonstrates that leaders of major powers, particularly the United States, had missed the signals that called for a perestroika. The result is a crisis that is not just financial and economic. It is political, too. The motto that emerged during the final decades of the 20th century had turned out to be unsustainable. 
it was based on a drive for super profits and hyper consumption for a few or unrestrained exploitation of resources and on social and environmental irresponsibility. But if all the proposed solutions and action now come down to a mere rebranding of the old system, we are bound to see another, perhaps even greater upheaval down the road. The current model does not need adjusting, it needs replacing. I have no ready-made prescriptions. And, you know, old Gorby, Peace Prize laureate, the guy who tried to catch the falling Humpty Dumpty and, pr- and is probably responsible for a few political assassinations here and there, and the trying to cover up that ugly little thing in Chernobyl, might just be right this time. And if in 2014 interviews Gorby said that the world is on the brink of a new Cold War, some say it's already begun, while at the same time stating that Putin protects Russia's interests better than anyone else, then in 2015 he already had said that the United States of America, because of their idea of triumphalism, has dragged us all in the Cold War, and it may escalate into a hot one soon. At the same time, he was sued by the leader of the Russian ultra-nationalistic Communistic Party. And the leader of this party is a deputy of the Gosduma, an MP of the Russia, Vladimir Zhirinovsky. He was sued for destroying the USSR and condemning many Soviet people to poverty. He called this whole thing a crime against humanity. <laughs> that again... Zhirinovsky often says that Latvian tanks are poised to invade Russia, therefore we must be nuked to oblivion. Other targets to be nuked to oblivion, according to Gorbachev, as he says in the public media, often include anything NATO in general, and the United States in particular. Oh, and Turkey lately. That and he boasts that the Russian military might can take out NATO in a matter of hours, and that the Americans are totally unprepared, weak, and unable to do anything should Russia would decide to go to war. So, maybe his views on Gorbachev, although undoubtedly amusing, shouldn't be taken that seriously. At any rate, this is, in my import- this is, in my opinion, an important food for thought. I'm reluctant to go into deeper analysis of the situation here, because although I'm getting my PhD as a political scientist, I don't want to offend anyone, especially in the extremely weird 2016 American election cycle, and in this current tense political situation in the world in general. You make your own decisions. But it would be wise if you'd think about some analogies here and take those in mind when going to the voting booths. But yeah, very extremely complicated and controversial man, our friend Gorbachev. Who knows, maybe he'll get his own sect in the Orthodox Church in time as well. (laughs) Hopefully not run by a greedy woman who uses his name to run from authorities and grab cash from the gullible people of the public. Anyhow, this is it for today's show. Next episode is coming in the end of March, or possibly earlier, if we'll finish our Strange Matters collaboration. Das svidanie, tavarishi! This podcast is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Visit darkmyths.org for more shows like this one. The darkness awaits. Thank you for listening to The Eastern Border. If you have any comments or specific details you'd like to know, you're welcome to leave it in the comment section on our site, theeasternborder.lv, and we'll rummage even to the western border to find you an answer. Like this podcast? Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or on our RSS feed. Happiness is mandatory. Good reviews and donations feed the farmers of our kolkhoz in the great motherland. The Eastern Border salutes you.